Next up, we have Alex Kiesling, CEO of Quera Computing. Did I say that right? Okay, okay. Analog and digital quantum computing with neutral atoms. So welcome, Alex. Thank you very much. Uh, it's very exciting to be here and be able to share with you uh, some very recent results from work that was done uh, both at Harvard and, and at Quera. Is mic working? Oh, I think it, I think it is now. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so I'm very happy to be here sharing some recent results uh, on analog and digital quantum computation with neutral atoms that has been done both at Harvard, MIT, uh, but also at Quera Computing, which is our startup that came out of, of the work that was done here at the universities. Uh, I'd like to start by looking at where we are in terms of frontiers in quantum science and engineering, and uh, I'd like to focus on two key challenges that remain. It's a very exciting time right now of fast and accelerating progress, uh, but it is still the case that building large scale control quantum machines is complicated and it's a large set of problems that we're still trying to tackle. We see that there is an inherent tension between having a high degree of controllability and the ability to scale up the, the types of systems that we use uh, while preserving this high degree of controllability and not uh, either increasing the, the complexity or decreasing in the, in the performance. Uh, there's many different platforms that are approaching this problem from different angles, uh, but there's still a lot of work to be done here. And the second one is, let's say that we have these machines, both the ones that, we ex that exist today and the ones that we're building that will exist tomorrow. What do we do with them? It's important that as technology progresses, we develop applications and algorithms that are producing value from the hardware that we have accessible nowadays. So our approach to, to try to tackle these, uh, these challenges is to use neutral atoms uh, held in optical tweezers. Uh, they, they have the ability to be very well isolated from the environment, giving us access to controlling hundreds of, of atoms, all of them identical to one another, with a very well-developed toolbox of uh, initialization, state readout, uh, but also intro introducing controls. There is uh, the ability with this platform to implement both analog and digital forms of quantum computation, which I will go into a little bit more detail in a second. Now, since optical, uh, optically trapped neutral atoms don't rely on manufactured chips. We have a lot of flexibility in how we position atoms relative to one another, and this is important on how they will interact with one another. Uh, this we can do several times a second, uh, changing the properties effectively of how the, the, the quantum processor is, is operating. Now to understand what neutral, atoms, neutral atom qubits are, I'll try to give you a very simple introduction. Um, you can think of a, a neutral atom as a two-state system where the electron can be in one of two states, either ground or what we call Rydberg state. And the Rydberg state is a, a effectively pulling the electron far away from the nucleus. The reason why this is uh, important is because this R state, this Rydberg state, gives atoms the ability to interact with one another at a significant uh, distance. Uh, while two atoms in the ground state, unlike many other forms of qubits, don't interact with one another, uh, two atoms in the Rydberg state interact very strongly with one another. And what that leads to is this the so-called Rydberg blockade radius. And one way to think about it, it's a very useful way to think about it, is that two atoms that are far away from one another act as completely uh, isolated. Two atoms that are close to one another will only allow one of them to be in the Rydberg state at any one time. So it's effectively conditional logic. Uh, now, taking this from two atoms to many, uh, when we place them on something like this in a, in a square grid, we can draw some connectivity that indicates which qubits can interact with which other qubits. And this doesn't rely on any form of cables. This is just given by where are the atoms optically trapped. Moreover, uh, we can set different conditions for the interactions of these qubits. And there's this other parameter that uh, is, is the tuning of a laser. The important thing to know about it is that when this parameter is large and negative, we are basically 
telling the atoms that being all in the ground state is fine. However, when we put them, when we make it large and positive, we're trying to maximize the number of atoms that can flip their state to the Rydberg state. But there is this added constraint of the connectivity. So no two lines that are, no two uh, vertices that are connected by a line can simultaneously be in the Rydberg state. So this is just a quick primer so you understand some of the results that I'm going to be describing. But this is the basis for a lot of what we do. Uh, of what we do. And the combination of these flexible geometries and the Rydberg blockade allows us to look at very efficient implementation of quantum simulation and quantum optimization algorithms. I'll start by telling you a little bit about <clears throat> work that we, we have done on analog quantum simulation of topological matter. Uh, we just heard a little bit about topological matter, but uh, just to refresh everyone from the last 20 minutes, uh, topological quantum matter particularly is something that is of large interest to the quantum computing uh, community because it has unique properties of matter that make it uh, robust against local noise. Uh, it has the potential to open up a, a very robust form of quantum computation. And the principles behind it were really described theoretically over 50 years ago, but it's taken us until now to really be able to have concrete evidence of topological quantum matter in the lab. The original idea for this came from, uh, from thinking about spins that are trying to anti-align and what happens to them when they are in a frustrated geometry like a triangular lattice. And the discovery here was that what they will do is they will form correlations uh, across pairs in what are called dimers. And to minimize the overall uh, energy of the system, these dimers will cover the entire grid by creating uh, local correlations between, uh, between pairs. And this, this complete covering uh, or dimer covering can take many different forms. And the idea of a quantum spin liquid, which is a particular form of topological quantum matter, is that in which there exists a macroscopic superposition of all of these different types of dimers. Now, if you take this idea to a slightly different uh, configuration, not a triangular lattice, but what we know as a Kagome lattice, we can actually enforce the same kind of condition by making sure that placing atoms along the, the links between nodes in the Kagome lattice uh, in a way that the Rydberg blockade radius, so the, the area that, that is blocked by an atom being in the Rydberg state is consistent with blocking all possible other atoms that would extend to, uh, to the nodes next to it. So maximizing in this case the number of Rydberg atoms uh, translates to creating a dimer covering of this lattice. Now, the idea here was, can we create a state that allows us to prepare this macroscopic superposition of all dimer coverings, as you see in the bottom? And this is what we set out to do uh, for ourselves in the lab. <clears throat> and the protocol that we used was Let's initialize all the atoms in their ground state and slowly nudge them towards preferring to be in the Rydberg state so that we, we um, adiabatically move into a state where the ground state is this subset of all dimer coverings. And as a function of, of, of the parameter that we were scanning, we can see that uh, there's a particular string order uh, correlator that tells us whether we are within the dimer space or how close we are with, uh, to, to being fully in the dimer space. <clears throat> and we see that this particular metric for larger and larger many body uh, uh, correlators uh, still gives us a measurable signal for, uh, for parts of the system that are of, of a, quite a large size of, of, of the entire system. Now, this tells us something about the the one basis, basically, are we creating things in this dimer state, but it could be that it's the same one over and over again, or that there's a few different states within this that are being selected, or that it's a classical, uh, a classical mixture. However, by uh, inducing dynamics, we can actually probe the coherence between all of these dimer subsets, <clears throat> uh, subsets and we can recover a measurable signal for uh, within the same uh, parameter regime for loops of, of uh, again, very large sizes. So this tells us that 
yes, we are preparing something that is within the, the dimer subspace and that it is a coherent superposition of all of these different combinations. So this is a direct measurement of a string cor correlator for a topological quantum phase of matter. Uh, this was something that we were working towards, but it actually led to, the, to a, an unexpected discovery that this phase is actually quite robust in, um, uh, in a situation that is away from equilibrium. So not necessarily the, the exact ground state of the system, but a dynamically prepared state that is, uh, that is metastable for, uh, for very long time. <clears throat> Now, taking this idea further, uh, what happens when we change the topology of the system and we make it non-trivial? Yeah. I want to make sure I understood that last statement. So uh, were you saying that you first checked in equilibrium, that you saw the, the string order parameter, it was stable, and then you sort of, just to push it further, you went far away from equilibrium to see if it survived, and then, you, and then it survived? Is that no, actually Actually, the, the statement here is slightly different. Okay. It's that, um, calculating the ground states of these systems is non-trivial, especially given the size. but what it turns so by calculating, you mean preparing in your system? No, no, calculating, calculating classically to try to predict oh. what is the exact last state. Uh, but what we've noticed is that when doing simulations in smaller system sizes, uh, which are consistent with the experimental data, the, the exact ground state of the system uh, deviates from this. And the region where it, it behaves as a quantum spin liquid is actually narrower than what we see. So the, the dynamic preparation of it puts the system in a state that is not exactly the ground state, a slightly higher energy state, meaning that it is out of equilibrium, but it actually has a much stronger overlap with the quantum spin liquid state. But the thing you're measuring is that you, I mean, at some level, you don't actually care exactly what state it's in, just as long as it has the string order parameter. Exactly. Right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now, Going to a so, list. Uh, one yeah. question, like your string, uh, your expected value of x here is like decaying exponentially over length of the string. Correct. Is that uh, just due to measurement noise or? Uh, some of it is measurement noise and the fact that we're not measuring in exactly the right basis. Uh, some of it okay. is that there is a finite uh, density of monomers. So this would be all dimers, but there is a finite density of monomers in the preparation. And there's actually, uh, uh, the way that this decays is, is well explained by this, this finite density of monomers. All right, so moving on to a less trivial topology where we have a hole, we can now actually identify two different distinct topological subspaces that are not connected by any local, uh, uh, local modifications. So any type of local uh, error can move us within one of the manifolds, but not between them. And in this way, we can define a zero and one logical subspaces for the, uh, for the system that we have here. And this can be the beginning of a uh, topological quantum bit. Uh, we, we see that even in this non-trivial topology, the, the, the kinds of behaviors that I was describing are still present there. And that through this uh, dynamical preparation, we can initialize a state that is uh, consistent with the zero plus one state, the X state. <clears throat> uh, there's a lot more work to be done here. Uh, and there is a lot more work that we are doing to understand how to, uh, how to adjust the, the dynamical preparation. But this is uh, a very encouraging start to start exploring how to, how to prepare and use topological quantum bits. I'm gonna shift gears now, and sorry that I'm speaking so fast. I have a lot of material that I wanna get through to encourage a lot of questions uh, during the networking session. Um, I'm gonna move on to a different application that uses very similar tools. And I'm just gonna use a different language. Instead of looking at quantum problems, I am now looking at how, how well can ha quantum hardware be used to solve classical problems, particularly in combinatorial optimization. And for this, I'm gonna focus on the maximum independent set problem. This is uh, a, a specific graph problem that given a graph like this one with a set of uh, nodes and, and edges connecting them, the problem is simply stated as finding or coloring the largest number of nodes so that no two of them are connected by an edge. 
And this type of, uh, of problem, finding the maximum independence set, while it's very easy to explain in principle what the problem is, solving it can become very, very hard. In, in fact, it is a, an NP complete problem. Uh, so it's, you can think of it as a, as a library of problems or, or a, la a language in which we can express many different problems. Uh, this, the, the, this, the kind of graph that I have here is a specific type of graph known as a unit disk graph. Uh, and the unit disk graph is defined by all nodes that are within a unit distance of one another will share an edge, but anything past that unit distance is it does not have an edge. So in, in, in a way, this is a local type of graph, the unit disk graph. Now I wanna point out that this is exactly the same connectivity constraint that I gave for having atoms within a 2D geometry, where the unit distance is given precisely by the, by the blockade radius size. <clears throat> Turns out that this is still an NP hard problem to solve. Uh, approximating it is easier than, than approximating generic uh, graphs. But again, finding solutions efficiently for this would of course be amazing. Now, using that, uh, what we do is we have now a way to encode problems, right? We have a way of creating these unit disk graphs uh, and we have a way of initializing uh, effectively the all zero state. And to try to solve the problem, not just encoded, what we use is Again, this, this slow changing of our control parameter delta that takes us from one ground state with all atoms in, in, the, in the electronic ground state to maximizing the number of Rydberg states, meaning exactly the MIS. By uh, parametrizing this, this evolution in a piecewise linear way, uh, we can throw this into a closed loop optimizer where <clears throat> a, a machine, a computer, is telling the, the quantum processor to initialize a particular graph. This is a, a King's graph, uh, implement the quantum evolution and then take a measurement. And from this measurement or really a set of multiple measurements with the same protocol, we can extract a figure of merit that is then put within a, a closed loop optimizer that then changes the variational parameters of that pulse that you see on the left to give us better and better performance. And this is what it looks like. Uh, not exactly in real time, but this is what, what the machine would do. We, we let it sit, uh, no one's touching it, no one's close to it. It's just doing its own thing uh, without any human intervention until it starts finding better and better solutions. What you see there uh, at the bottom is the figure of merit getting better and better over time. Using this, we can find <clears throat> uh, good waveforms that allow us to uh, get better approximations. And we can test those on many different uh, graph instances of different sizes, and also by varying the total evolution time. <clears throat> what you're seeing here is taking four different graph instances and running this on the quantum hardware, but also using simulated annealing. Uh, in the initial portion of it, uh, the, the high energy, we see that this is, uh, the, the behavior is, is basically the same across the board. However, uh, for, for the different graph instances, the behavior as we start getting closer and closer to the good solutions uh, changes from instance to instance. And interestingly, we see that for the classical algorithm, um, specifically the, the simulated annealing, we see that it can get stuck at near optimal solutions. And the way that we understood this is to think about how many near optimal solutions there are versus how many optimal solutions there are and how are they connected. And from this, we can extract a single number that we call the hardness parameter that tells us how likely is it that the classical algorithm will get stuck in, in one of these suboptimal solutions. Uh, so we can now use this to reparametrize all of the different graphs in different sizes as a function of their hardness parameter. For the- Sorry, can I just ask? Yeah. The output of this, uh, of your computation is not a specific uh, maximal independent set, but rather an estimate of these independent numbers? It is, it is an independent set. Well, you do and then we measure. So what it, what it looks like is effectively like this. And what we do is that we measure how many red circles we have. Oh, I see. And then we say there were, you know. But you should take the max, right? Like, well, uh, for, for the optimization, we take the average over multiple iterations <clears throat> because the max is much more susceptible to noise. But eventually, if you're running this to get the best the best solution that you can, you will take the max. Okay, that's why I was. Yeah. 
So for the quantum algorithm, what we what we found is that rather than depending uh, just on this hardness parameter, it actually depends, as many of you may expect, on how the gap closes throughout this transition. And the, the experiment is actually quite susceptible to this. It's information that we can extract directly from the experiment without having to calculate it numerically. Um, from that, we see that uh, when, we, when we look at the size of the gap that we're crossing, uh, when the, the evolution of the, of the circuit is long enough that it becomes susceptible to that, to that uh, gap, then we see a Land, uh, landau zener uh, scaling. However, if the, 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 the circuit is too shallow and we effectively don't see the whole graph, then the performance of it is, is basically the same across the board. And it's, you know, it's limited to, to here it's, I don't know, 0.05 or so. Now, when we take this into consideration and we, we look at our two benchmarks, classical and quantum, we see that if we take the whole data set, the classical and quantum seem to scale in the same way as a function of this hardness parameter. But if we focus on the quantum instances where we know we were able to, row, to run a deep enough circuit, we actually see a super linear, nearly quadratic speed up uh, in, in the deep circuit regime. And this, these particular results have a product of the size of the graph to the, the depth of the circuit uh, exceeding 2000. So this is already telling us something that is very hard to predict numerically with classical systems. Sorry, maybe you said it in this. What, what classical benchmarks are you We're using? We're using simulated annealing with correlated so, uh, spin oh, flips. I, oh, this is so, so this is classical. Oh, sorry. Correct. Yeah. I thought this was a separate quantum thing. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> sorry, sorry. This is okay. We're, we're using a very generic uh, classical algorithm. Okay. Gotcha. So these two results in analog uh, operation that I showed were performed on a machine that exists at Harvard, but we're taking this now out of the university and into the commercial realm to make it available to everyone. Uh, and at Quera, we just finished uh, uh, all the tests on our first machine called Equilab, which gives you access to the same capabilities that you just heard about. And uh, as of two weeks ago, you can access it on the cloud. Uh, we hope that this is helpful for your research and that you can now use this as a platform to develop your own algorithms. Uh, the way to program it is simple. It's you, you define the, the geometry, the uh, evolution of the Hamiltonian, and then run the program and analyze your data. Uh, for more information, we're going to have a webinar this upcoming Monday. And for those of you interested in running anything on, on the machine, I must say that AWS provides research grants for this. I'm going to very quickly shift gears again and tell you about another direction where we're taking things. Uh, and this is uh, in digital quantum computation and really thinking towards quantum error correction, and how we're going to get there. Uh, so the, the key idea behind this is to now rethink this reconfigurability of the, of the connectivity, uh, <clears throat> not just at the beginning of the, of the calculation, but also throughout. And the way that we do this is we know that we can create entanglement between pairs of atoms by using uh, logic gates. And by having uh, atoms across a 2D plane, we can bring pairs of atoms together, create entanglement. And then we can actually map the quantum information in the GR uh, states that I had mentioned to two hyperfine states that uh, allow us to preserve the memory there for over a second. We can then use optical tweezers to move them around, reconnect, and then apply another set of entangling gates to now connect very different parts of the processor. Uh, using this uh, approach, uh, we can generate long range entanglement using only local gates and atom transport. And this has applications in many different directions, including error correction, uh, but also hybrid analog digital uh, architecture. The one example that I wanna share with you on this is how we prepare a toric uh, uh, a toric code on, a, uh, on an actual torus by moving atoms around. And the way that this toric code is, is done is with 16 data qubits and eight ancilla qubits. Here, the ancilla qubits are in red. And what you're gonna see them do is uh, implement gates between the ancilla and the, and the data qubits, move them around. And by the end of this, we can separate the ancilla qubits and be left only with the data qubits. Uh, the next steps here are to uh, to do real-time measurement and feed forward. But at least for now, we can do a measurement at the end where we can extract all of the, um, all of the stabilizers and using that information, uh, do quantum error detection 
and see the performance across the two different encoded logical uh, bits. And what we see, of course, is that the one that has the, the longer support has better performance than the shorter one. So this is now already a platform that allows us to compare side by side uh, different quantum error correction algorithms in, in, our, in our search for new and more efficient ones. Uh, this includes things like hypergraph and LDPC codes that have been very hard to implement with any other kind of hardware. Uh, the last thing is we're, look, we're working towards enhanced controllability and we're looking at a future with thousands of atoms that we can move and efficiently uh, implement gates with. And now what we're working towards is to make the controls uh, more sophisticated and more controlled. <clears throat> and for this, we're developing photonic integrated circuit solutions that give us performance that is better than anything that has been reported in the visible range for uh, optically addressing individual atoms uh, and building these tools in a scalable way. And this is a little snapshot of what an early prototype of our devices looked like. And you can see that uh, we, can, we can modulate individual channels actually very quickly uh, with this device. I'm gonna leave things there and just thank everyone that has been part of this big adventure, both at Harvard and at Quera, and open the room for questions. So in the first half of your talk, it was uh, basically building an optimization machine. Uh, and uh, it seems like uh, lately we've had a lot of classical optimization machines. Do we need to bring quantum mechanics in? Uh, is the advantage going to be big enough? We don't know, but I think that the most I can say is that we will not know until we build these devices and start working with them. There is, it's more than, than an optimizer. Uh, it can do, I mean, it can prepare quantum states that have nothing to do with optimization and it can also prepare to look at dynamics of quantum states. So it's actually much more powerful than an optimizer, but I think that the use cases in optimization are prevalent enough that it is worth asking the question, question. How, how can we leverage quantum devices to get better at them? No, I don't